Okay, excellent. So we have Leslie Davis here. Thank you for joining us. I'm so excited to meet you and to chat with you. Um, I was looking through your book and your website. You are the author of You Can't Eat Love. And I, I love that title. Um, I was sitting next to my husband the other night in bed and I had mentioned the title of your book and he didn't understand it. And I was like, it's about, you can't eat your feelings. Like you can't eat your way to love. You have to learn to love yourself and to love others first. And he was like, oh, when you put it that way, I get it. And it made me realize that men don't have the same mindset as we do. They don't, it didn't even cross his mind what that meant because he's never had to think about that ever a day in his life. So it was, it was interesting to kind of also look at that perspective, like as women, we think about weight, we think about our physical appearance, you know, and, and food can be our friend and can be such an emotional crutch. And it's just, I think it's so unique to us. I know that, you know, some men have similar situations and it, it, it does affect them as well. But for the majority of, of women, it's something that, you know, even as little as like eight, nine, 10 years old, I was thinking about, is this food good? Is this food bad? you know, is this going to make me fat? Is this low fat? Is this low calorie? Um, I remember telling my grandmother like, oh, I'm fat. And she was like, what? You're like, you're 11. What are you talking about? That's crazy. And I'm like, no, it's not. I'm fat. That's what we say. We're fat, right? No. Um, so I'm so glad you're here. And I, I just love that you were able to kind of put your own work and your own experience into a book so that others can really learn and take away, you know, a lot of value and hopefully get to them at a point where it's it's really needed. So tell us a little bit about your book and then I kind of want to back it up. Um, so I, would, I would love to hear first for you to kind of just um, give the audience a little summary. Well, the book is essentially um, the aha moments that I had when I made a decision to get healthy mentally, physically, and emotionally. Um, and it was truthfully a moment when I was eating a pie, when I realized, you know, as you said, I was trying to eat something and fill a hole that I thought existed when it really didn't exist. And all that I was missing was I didn't love myself. And so then I began that journey of learning to love myself um, because my biggest aha was how can I expect someone to love me as I am if I am not loving myself as I am? Uh, because we truthfully, we teach other people how to treat us. And when we are speaking negatively or not treating ourselves well, we are teaching other people who are observing us how to treat us. And as a consequence, you know, they think it's okay not to speak nicely to us or not to um, acknowledge our thoughts, our dreams, and our desires. Um, but the other thing that I really came to a, a giant understanding of, and, you know, it's interesting that you were talking about your husband. I live in a house full of males. Okay. I've got a husband. I've got three boys. That's why we only have female dogs. Cause I said, that's enough testosterone. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, living in a house with males, I had the expectation that they would understand how I felt. Well, I'm, I'm, let me just give you a ginormous aha. Men are not wired to understand. They are wired to see things as they are and they want to fix problems. They're problem solvers. Women, females, are wired to sit around, not, not literally, but to look at something from all sides and to take into consideration how someone might feel about something. Now, I'm not saying all men don't feel and all men are not aware of emotions, but they've learned it. They've been taught that. So in living, you know, in this household of males, I, one of the lessons that I had to learn and one of the skills I had to practice was how to verbalize my feelings in such a way that I began to get what it was that I needed. But it all circled back to learning to love myself so that I could ask for the love that I wanted and not be demonstrating, um, speaking ugly to myself, and then saying to somebody else, well, you don't love me because you're not doing X, Y, Z, you know, when what they're observing is, well, I don't love myself. So, you know, the subtitle to the book is 
how learning to love yourself can change your relationship with food. And what I realized was food was my drug of choice. Mm -hmm. It was my way to numb whatever pain that I felt because I did not know how to feel. I didn't, I, I was running from the emotions and it was much easier to kill the pain with food than it was to feel the feelings. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you know, any drug of choice, that's really the, usually the, the motive there. Um, how did you notice your relationships with other people change once you learned to love yourself? Cause that was interesting. You were saying that, you know, you show others how to treat you. What shifts did you notice when you began to treat yourself better? Um, well, other people did not like that I was putting myself and my wishes and my desires first. I mean, for example, when a conversation would come up, where do you want to go eat? And I would say, well, you know, um, I, today I would really like to go out and eat Chinese food. And somebody would say, well, you know, I'm not really feeling like Chinese food because da, 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 you know, whatever their excuse was. I said, well, you know, I, I can hear what you're saying, but you asked me where I would like to go eat. And this is where I would like to go. And, you know, next time we can go to where you want to go. But right now, today, you asked me where I wanted to go. And so I started getting pushback. Um, and at first I started thinking, well, maybe I need to give in. But then I went back to, you know, what is my intention? What is my purpose? My purpose is to learn to love myself. How am I showing myself that I am a worthwhile person? The way that I do that is I'm clear on my intentions, I'm clear on my wishes, and I'm clear on my desires, and I draw that boundary, I draw that line, so that I don't allow someone to push against it when it's important to me. Now, I'm not saying that my boundaries, my lines are rigid and inflexible, but I learned that sometimes I would need to say, this is important to me. Right now, this is important to me. And I would verbalize that so that the other person would understand. And then they could make a choice. Because truthfully, I don't know if anybody else realized this, but we can only control ourselves. We cannot control anyone else. We have zero control over anyone else. None. Zone. Stop. We've got a dog. <laughs> <laughs> is he, what is he? Is he making his little bed comfortable? Yes. <laughs> I love that. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. We love dogs. Mine's still sleeping in the bed. <laughs> well, I've got three. Uh, the Labradoodle and I've got... Uh, anyway, i got three dogs. Okay. Um, but, you know... I realized I can only control me. I can only do something about me and everybody else is in control of them. So I needed to be clear on what it was that I wanted and what I needed. And the clearer that I got, I'm not saying that it was easy because there is pushback because truthfully, let's face this. Um, and I believe you were talking about this earlier, earlier today. I feel like, you know, we've been talking for hours because I was just... <laughs> Uh, but people around us don't like change. We don't even like change. But when we are taking control of the control that we do have and other people um, start seeing that we are changing, they're like, wait a minute, hold on, hang on. I, I much preferred it when you went out to, when you'd like to go out to eat five times in a week, um, I much preferred it when, you know, we could do whatever the heck it was that we would do. I much preferred it when I got to pick the TV shows all the time. I much preferred all these things because people don't like change. First of all, we as human beings don't like change, period. But then when we impose change on someone else as a consequence of the fact that we are changing, oh my goodness, then it can get really interesting. And that's yeah. where we circle back around to what is our intention? What, what was my intention? My intention was to get healthy physically, mentally, and emotionally. So as a consequence, they had to deal with whatever static they had in their life as a consequence of me changing. And some people moved away from me. And you know what? That is okay. That's all right. Some people moved closer. And that's amazing. That's even better. Mm -hmm. But control what you can control. And the only thing you're in control of is yourself. Yeah, that's so true. It's interesting how hard that is for so many of us to, to live, you know, I, 
I'm doing some some work with the to be magnetic pathway membership and that's kind of you know removing some of these blocks and self-limiting beliefs and they talk a lot about your authentic code and running your decisions through that authentic code and I think that's similar to what you're saying you know in terms of intention what is my intention it's to get healthy to feel better mentally physically emotionally and does this you know, the decision I'm making, how does that align with those intentions or that authentic code? And then you act accordingly. And it's not about how that affects other people. You know, obviously to an extent, we don't want to put anybody in harm's way, but it, you know, it's, it's about you for once, instead of just accommodating and people pleasing um, and making sure that you're living, you know, your authentic self. And it's not about the Chinese food. It's about setting that boundary and being able to, you know, voice your opinion and, and feel comfortable and strong in that. So that's, that's amazing. Um, I want to take it back to, I always like to ask how someone's kind of upbringing, you know, where it all started. What was your childhood like and where did you grow up? Uh, well, my dad's a petroleum engineer, so we moved around quite a bit. But um, part of the time for uh, approximately five years, we lived in Venezuela and we lived in these camps and in, in camps. And as a consequence, you don't have toot and totes, you don't have restaurants or anything like that. We had the country club and a bunch of houses at a school. And my mother would have to go outside of the camp to the commissary. And so she would go once every two weeks. Um, so food, while it was available, it was not easily accessible. Uh, and I'm the oldest of six kids. So, you know, you can only stock so many groceries. Space mm -hmm. is a limiter. Um, so for five, that, those five years, food was not really accessible, um, not because we couldn't afford it. It simply wasn't accessible. Uh, then we moved um, out here to Katy, which used to be in the country, and the closest grocery store was 20 miles away um, again. No fast foods, no, you know, corner stores or anything like that. So again, the food that was available was what was brought in. My mother went to the grocery store every two weeks. Again, you know, pantry space limits what you can have. Um, so we would go to my grandparents' house and they would have all kinds of snacks and things like that because my grandfather required there be snacks and things in the house because he never had an issue with it. He could eat one Oreo cookie and be quite satisfied. I, me, on the other hand, Oreos do not know how to behave, so they need to stay at the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, it's not that I have a problem with them. It's simply they do not know how to right, behave. So, right. you know, they can stay at the grocery store. <laughs> They're not welcome uh, here. <laughs> they're not welcome here. Uh, my husband doesn't understand that, but you know what? That's his problem. It's not mine. Uh, um, so when I uh, had access to food that was, you know, either novel or unlimited, I didn't know how to stop. <clears throat> uh, because I hadn't been taught portion control. I hadn't been taught, you know, you can eat until you are satisfied. You can have just a little bit because it will be here again. Um, now I made certain with my own children, they never had to clean their plates. You know, if it was a food they didn't like, they didn't have to eat it. You know, I never imposed any of that. We never had conversations about you must eat or whatever. So as a consequence, none of my kids have issues with, with weight or food. Of course, they're also boys. So that's a whole nother realm. Um, but I, I say in the book, you know, forget about the freshman 14 or 15 when I went to college, you know, within the first week, I'd probably put on 20 pounds uh, because you could go through the line more than once. I mean, holy cow. <laughs> You're eating, thinking about the fact that you can get more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm eating, thinking about the fact that I could get more. And I'd never had chicken fried steak before. Yes, I've been in Texas most of my life. Didn't even know that chicken fried steak existed. I go off to Texas Tech and they have chicken fried steak once a week. And I'm thinking, where has this been my whole entire life? <laughs> uh, so, you know, food and I, um, food to me was, just, you know, one of those very bad boyfriends. You know, uh, I did. Yeah, I did like, not why know am I here how, again. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't know how to handle the relationship. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I, I had a similar experience because I grew up in a house where my mom was very health conscious. It was '80s, early '90s, so that was like fat-free cookies and you know, low-fat milk, and that was that was healthy. You know, her 
the intention was there. We've just learned so much since then. But when we would go to my grandparents' house every Sunday for 14 years, she would buy everything we weren't allowed to have. And I would binge it until it was gone. Bagel bites, hostess cakes, ice cream, sodas, like everything that I wasn't allowed to have. I would literally eat it until I was sick. And I, so I definitely can relate to that kind of mindset where you're like, wow, I, I never had this. I'm, I just want, I want to keep going because I don't know where it might come next. I might never be able to have it again. Um, so I'm guessing that that played into your life throughout adulthood. Um, can you kind of walk us through that as well? Um, kind of how that infiltrated your, your life beyond college. Well, you know, once I got out of college, then it was like, okay, I need to be um, thin. And I, I finally had, I, actually what happened is I had a boyfriend that my <clears throat> psyche knew I didn't need to be with. And so my body was reacting by making me very, very sick. Anytime I looked at food or was around him, I was, you know, horribly sick um, to the point that the doctor was ready to put me in the hospital or uh, I said, how about if I just go home? He said, go home for the weekend. Let's see what happens. And that was when I realized it was the boyfriend that was uh, my body was reacting to once I yeah. offloaded him. But that allowed me to lose the weight that I had packed on. And so I was back to being thin again. And my hip bones, you know, were ahead of my stomach and all that kind of stuff. So I fought, you know, trying to make sure that my legs didn't touch when I walked, my hip bones, you know, were ahead of my stomach and all these other crazy parameters that I put on myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I was denying myself food. So when I would be confronted with it, you know, the binging, the whatever, I'd go crazy with it. Okay, so you fast forward to the point where I have children. Okay, so then it's like, okay, well, you should be doing this and you should be doing that, um, trying to live within those rules. And my inner child would start pushing against those rules saying, well, how come I can't have whatever? And so then that was when I slid over into the emotional eating um, cause I didn't know what to do with the feelings. Cause I grew up not knowing what to do with the feelings. I grew up being told, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Uh, so it was really as an adult that the emotional eating started coming in when I started the sneak eating and that kind of stuff. Um, and that just, you know, looking back, I can see the harm that we do to children by creating a relationship with food outside of it simply being fuel. I mean, can you imagine if your car had a relationship with gas? Let's think about this. If your car had a relationship with gas, what would be going on? Every time you passed, you know, a, a toot and toad or after it had gotten you out of, you know, some major traffic jam, a long trip, you know, whatever it's going, I've got to get to the gas station and get some gas. I want some of that, you know, premium unleaded. Think about that. How crazy is that? It is. How crazy is that? But that's and your car's like overfill my tank. I need more than it really can can handle. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Makes no sense. <laughs> No, no. And, and so if it was, you know, when I started looking at myself as the, the food is fuel. Now, I'm not going to lie to anybody and I'm not going to say I never, ever do whatever. But uh, in fact, the other day I ate 12 sugar cookies, um, not the kind with the icing on them, just 12 sugar <laughs> cookies that I had made. Why? Because they were sitting there. They were occupying too big of a box. I couldn't, <laughs> there was no way that I could have transferred them to a smaller container. It wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to work out. So I had to, you know, did what you had all. to do. <laughs> I did what I had to do. Yes, exactly. With intention. <laughs> with intention. <laughs> I didn't want to dirty another container, <laughs> but I, I had, the, you know, this realization that my body is, is like a car. It only needs so much fuel. Now, when I began the journey, I was driving this massive one ton, you know, pickup with an extended bed on it. And it required, you know, two fuel tanks in order to be able to go anywhere because it burned through so much gas. Um, but, you know, now I'm driving a much, much, much smaller car. 
uh, where I, you know, only need about, you know, 14 gallons of gas. I don't need 30 plus gallons of gas. So once I started, I tell myself stories all the time. So <laughs> anyway, this is I'm, a figurative <laughs> story, right? Not a literal. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. But if, if we look at it, you know, when we're, when we are looking at our body, the same way that we look at the gas tank on a car, then we can understand we only need X amount. Okay. So let's figure out in that X amount of food that our body requires, how can we enjoy or get the most enjoyment out of the food that we're going to be putting into our body instead of looking at it? Well, you know what? Today I have to eat, you know, this much spinach and I really don't like spinach. I'm of the opinion, if you don't like it, don't eat it. Mm -hmm. Because if we are eating stuff we don't like, you know what's going to happen? The Oreo cookies are going to be falling into your cart. They're going to be paid for when, you know, when you go through the grocery store checkout line. And for some reason, they are going to end up in the front seat of the car as you are driving home. And by the time you get to the house, either half of them or all of them are going to be gone. That's what happens when we say we have to. Yep. It's that whole idea of should. You should, you shouldn't. And, and you know, we we get into this cycle of that restriction and then that binge and it's you know it's every time there's no exception it happens every time if you restrict you're going to binge if you tell yourself you can't have something it's like the boyfriend it's like the food the oreos it's just you know once we can kind of take a step back and recognize those cycles and those patterns and realize that nothing is changing if we're not doing anything differently it's just going to continue. Those Oreos are going to keep following you home and keep jumping in your cart. <laughs> oh my gosh. You're just speaking my language right now. I, this is something that I've gone, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. It's taken years and years. And I think this is why you and I both do this work because we want to help other people break that cycle sooner rather than later. Cause it's almost like that light bulb goes off and you're like, what? why, why didn't I realize this sooner? but you're filling that emotional void. So what do you think, how do you think that works, you know, within the brain? I guess it's that reward system where if you're feeling stressed or you're feeling tired or you're overwhelmed, or you have, you know, three kids or you have a stressful job, you've learned, I guess, over the course of the years that that food can satiate that feeling temporarily, right? So I guess being able to go for that comfort, that thing that's familiar that you can kind of just like numb out that temporarily satisfies that need until you need to do it again, because you're not actually dealing with the stress or the work or the children. Um, was that kind of your experience? Well, yes, exactly. <clears throat> and then if you look at the media um, and even other people, people will say, I'm a stress eater. OK, mm -hmm. or you see um, in TV shows, movies, commercials, the child, the person is sad. The person brings them, you know, food. I mean, think about this. Somebody dies. What happens? Gallons of people show up showering you with food. OK, because, you know, they're trying to take care of you. you know, in, in truth, the, the whole um, thing of bringing food when somebody dies is because usually the family, you know, way back when the family wasn't able to provide for themselves in that moment. And so right. they needed an opportunity to get back up on their feet. But here today, when we've got easy access to grocery stores, that really isn't true anymore. But you end up, you know, with gallons of food showing up instead of saying, because people don't really know how to handle somebody who was feeling. It doesn't make any difference if people are feeling sad or if they're feeling happy. Most people have no clue how to cope with someone else feeling sad or feeling happy. So they're thinking, okay, well, why aren't I feeling happy? Why, why am I not excited about something? What's going on in my life? Let me tell you how bad things are at my house. You know, instead of simply being able to celebrate them in their moment, knowing, hoping, believing that when it's your moment, you know, they're going to celebrate or they're going to, you know, mourn with you. Um, but there's the Kit Kat commercial. I can't stand this commercial. The little girl is on the other side of the bathroom door and she's apparently very sad. And the mother is on, you know, the outside where you can see her and she shoves a Kit Kat under the door to help the child feel better. What is that message? 
what is that message? When truthfully, what the child needed was probably the mother just to pick her up or sit next to her, put her arm around her and say, I can see that you're feeling sad. You want to talk about it? You know, I can only imagine what you're feeling right now. Because let, let's go back to even younger than that. A small child is learning how to walk. They fall down. They cry. How many times do you see or have you done or whatever? Somebody picking them up and saying, oh, you're not hurt. Well, yeah, they, they were crying. You know, they were hurt. How about mm-hmm. just acknowledging, oh, my goodness, I can just imagine how much that hurts. You want to sit here for just a second until you're feeling better and then you can go on. Because what I realized is it sets off this cognitive dissonance so that we are having this feeling and then we're thinking, wait a minute, I shouldn't be feeling like this. There's that whole mm-hmm. should word again, but this is how I feel. So now what do I do? when you know with this feeling because i shouldn't be feeling it and so it sets off this war inside of ourselves well whenever we have that war going on inside of ourselves that adrenaline starts you know raising and then we start on that hunt that hunt for something to stop the pain to stop it Mm -hmm. and what do we usually end up grabbing for our drug of choice And truthfully, all we need is someone to say, I can only imagine how much that hurt. Acknowledge it. It's a really good point. It's interesting. You know, when you reference that commercial, there's still a literal wall between the two of them, but food will make everything better instead of the human connection. That's really, it's sad. You know, marketing is a whole, (laughs) that's a whole other podcast that we could go down into. Um, but yeah, it's just such a shame. And, you know, here's a young girl and other young girls are watching this and relating to her. And they're like, well, I felt sad before. Like, I guess all I needed was a Kit Kat, not a hug from my mom. Um, that's really, yeah, it's, it's, it's a shame actually. <laughs> but, you know, at some point we can kind of recognize that and make steps in a different direction. While we're speaking of children and inner child, you created an adult coloring book as well, didn't you? Yes. I love that. I have one actually right over here. I'm going to need to get yours, but embracing that inner child is so important as an adult. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what, what is inner child? What is your inner child and how you can really kind of rework that to change some of the patterning in your adult life and how a coloring book, for example, doing things you did as a child, how that is important. Well, um, for so many people, especially me, I'm the oldest of six kids. Some of us really weren't kids. We were busy taking care of other children. And so, you know, we lose that, that fun thing. Let's do something fun. Let's be creative. Let's laugh. Let's, you know, just be silly. And, um, to, as, as adults, we need to laugh. We need to be silly. We need to color outside of the lines, And so I was looking around, well, what is something that I could do by myself that would allow me just to be, you know, creative and crazy? And I don't know if you ever did this, but we used to get a piece of paper and close our eyes and just take a pencil and draw until, you know, we thought we'd covered the whole paper. And then we'd start coloring, you know, the different little shapes and things like that. Um, Until we finished it, we'd have, you know, these amazing stained glass looking pieces of art. Uh, Mm. So to me, the coloring book is like that because it's very freeing and very liberating and you don't have to color inside the lines. Nobody is telling you what color to do it, but also it can take you back um, as an adult. It can take you back to some happier times. You can remember, you can relive, you can relate, you can recall, you can recount If you're coloring with somebody else, you can say, hey, this reminds me of the time when we got that that 366 page coloring book and we colored every single page in it in order. And it was so much fun. And we had that giant box of Crayola crayons. Do you remember how great it smelled when you opened that box of 64 crayons? And how fun it was to look at all those brand new crayons. I mean, it just sets off all kinds of great memories, which is amazing. And the best thing about it is not one of those things relates to food. They're simply memories. 
you feel good, you enjoy the moment, you can celebrate those things, which is what our brain wants. Our brain wants to be happy, but there's no food in there anywhere. And so we can begin building relationships with something else. That's so true. Because as a kid, we hardly ever thought about, we were just playing and like, oh, coming in for dinner was such a hassle, interrupting our (laughs) flow. But I, I find it so relaxing, like doing the, when I remember a few years ago, I was in a, in a, it was a stressful period during work and we had all these calls or so many conference calls and they were like eating my soul. So I got a coloring book and I ripped a page out for the entire team. And we would sit there on the conference calls on speaker and we would color and it would keep, we would be able to like keep our cool. And in fact, other members of the company would then come and sit with us in, in silence and just kind of also color when they needed a break. So it was something that we used as like a stress reliever. Um, but I think it's so important to do things. I always tell my clients, like when I coach one-on-one, I always ask them what was something they enjoyed to do as a child? Was it roller skating? Was it coloring? Was it, you know, putting on a play? Was it doing, you know, making tie-dye t-shirts? What was something that you liked to do as a kid? And how can you incorporate that into your adult life because we need that outlet was it you know running through the park maybe it was gymnastics and you know you can't do flips on a balance beam anymore but how can you find a piece of that that you had you know as a child into your adult life so I love that you you did that did you so that must have felt very nostalgic for you creating a coloring book when you used to literally create your own as a kid not just the coloring but you would make yourself something to color that's really cool (laughs) It, it, it felt really good. And I, I hoped, you know, that other people would enjoy the coloring um, because I realized, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do when I was growing up is I wanted to be an adult. Well, there, there is no roadmap for being an adult, but my image of an adult was they were serious and they didn't have a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, don't ask me where that came from. <laughs> But, you know, as time has gone on, I realized my image of an adult was all wrong. Adults really do need to have fun. They they need to, as you said, you know, reflect back on what it was that they enjoyed as a child and do it now to the best of their ability, because we need to laugh. We need to relax. We need to release those cares. And the best way to release the cares and the best way to help yourself, especially if you're despairing or despondent, the best way to help yourself feel better to relieve that is to laugh. And laughter really is the best medicine. And what is the best way to laugh when we're having fun? Yeah, yeah. And I feel like if we don't, we're going to go find that outlet in other things, whether it's alcohol or food or toxic relationships, you're, you're going to find the outlet, whether you want to or not. So, you know, it's important to make sure it's the right outlet for you because those feelings aren't going to go away. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause feelings are going to come out. In, yeah. I mean, they, they are going to come out. That's so, I love that. I love that. I, I want to, get into my coloring book later today. (laughs) Um, So in your book, as you were writing your book, you talked about kind of having that aha moment, looking in the mirror and just not being happy with what you saw. What did that feel like? What did you see? Because what you see is clearly different than what your children see or your husband saw, but to you that had such an impact and it was the catalyst to make them change. What did you see that day? I saw a disappointment um, that my my mother and my grandmother and all these people would be disappointed that I had let myself get into this state. But more importantly, I was disappointed in myself that I had allowed the real Leslie to get so buried under the weight of everybody else's dreams and desires that I was unrecognizable. Mm. I mean, I didn't even recognize my own smile. Um, wow. And so it was, it was very, very sad um, <clears throat> because I was responsible for the mess. So you took accountability that day. I did. I did. And as I talk about, uh, not so much in the book as I do with other people, but 
uh, put your own oxygen mask on first. Um, because when you're on the plane and that plane loses pressure, you've got 30 seconds. And if you're busy putting other people's oxygen masks on, you're going to be laid out in the aisle. The plane's going to land. They're going to step over you and they're going to say, there's that very nice person who helped me. But where are you going to be? And that was a huge realization for me. I'd been running around taking care of everyone else. And I was completely abandoning myself to the point that I didn't recognize myself when I saw myself in a mirror. And I, that was why I hated, I hated to see myself. I hated even to see a shadow. That's hard. It's, it's like the lowest point, but then from that grows something that you never could have imagined. And that's beautiful in and of itself. Well, and um, I tell people now that if I would have known how hard the work was going to be, I don't know that I ever would have done it. I'm incredibly grateful that I did. Mm -hmm. And I'm also incredibly grateful I did not know how hard it was going to be. But let's think about this. <clears throat> Diamonds are formed under extreme heat and extreme pressure. Yeah. So all I did was become a diamond. Exactly. Now you're shining bright. <laughs> I love that. What was the first step that you took after that moment? What was the, the action? What really started to kind of propel you on this journey? Um, the first thing that I did was I started reading um, some self-help books. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, what was, I can't remember the name of the very first one that I read, uh, but then I started um, doing some Bible reading, reading in Proverbs, and I had heard from some other people, and I thought they were crazy, that they would write in journals, mm -hmm. and I'm not a journal writer. I always swore I would never write in a journal, so do not tell me that I write in a journal. <laughs> so instead, <laughs> it's the Oreo's fault. <laughs> <laughs> so in, instead, I have conversations with myself every morning, and um, I write about three pages every single morning having a conversation with myself. They're not journals. Um, <laughs> but I've got a stack of notebooks. It's probably two feet high, um, you know, from having all these conversations with myself. But that was really the biggest turning point was having honest conversations with myself and I had to laugh a couple of times because I would be, be, you know, talking to myself and I'd say, wait a minute, I don't want to write that down because I don't want, you know, I, I don't want it to be, you know, permanent. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who, who are you trying to fool here? Just right, right. write it down. <laughs> and don't worry about it. You know, keep on going. Um, because as I say in the book, there's me, myself, and I. You can lie to me and myself, but I sees everything. And so I caught my own self saying, okay, me and myself are going to lie to I about what I'm really thinking and feeling about this. And I said, hold on, I already know. So you might as well just tell me. <laughs> yeah, it's that like that self-judgment. It's really hard to, to, to kind of push that aside. We judge even ourselves, even in your writing, your conversation with yourself, <laughs> you're still having that little piece that, that's maybe judging what you're thinking or what you're feeling or what you're writing. Um, that's interesting. So, you know, I think you mentioned a few of what, what I call the primary foods, and these are so important to getting healthy and to, you know, balancing out your, your wellness and your, in your life. That's education. You started reading self-help books and educating yourself and being willing to learn and then spirituality, you know, getting back into the Bible and kind of connecting in that way. And then a little bit of creativity too, in, in the writing and the conversing and, and, um, the relationship aspect of it too, the relationship with yourself that came through writing in the notebooks, not journaling, writing in the <laughs> notebooks each day, taking notes on yourself. Um, I love that. And those are, those are three action steps that somebody can actually take instead of just saying like, well, this sounds great. I love this idea. You know, I, I would like to put myself on that path as well, but to actually take steps in your daily life that will affect change can be something like writing in a journal, writing in a notebook, um, reading, reading, I think is just so important. And it doesn't have to be this lengthy, you know, um, 
book on health or well-being. I mean, it can be something as simple as a daily blog that you really resonate with or something like that. Just getting outside of your head and finding a different perspective and opening up your, you know, your own mind to different ways of doing things. I, I like that you kind of went on that path. What happened next after you started implementing some of those things? Um, well, what happened next is I wanted more. I, it felt I just, good. It felt good. I wanted more. And I knew that I could, I could do something. But I also felt a shift in the way that I was thinking about myself. <clears throat> and I felt a shift in how I saw myself. And I said, okay, now I see that there is possible. And as I started realizing that there was possible, I wanted more of it. And when I would um, backtrack into some of my, you know, previous habits, because face it, habits don't go away. People think that you can break a habit. No, you cannot break a habit. You can put it in a cellar, you can lock it down there, but it doesn't go away. It's there, it's waiting to spring out. Um, but as, as I would, you know, retreat back into some of those other behaviors, I would go, wait a minute, I forgive myself, let's figure out what's going on. But I just found myself getting stronger and stronger. And even now today, because this journey began almost six years ago, um, I still, I want more. I want more. I'm still on a journey to love, to learn, to discover. And I started listening to um, podcasts like your podcast, you know, because that way I'm filling my mind with other ideas, other mm -hmm. options I'm discovering. Um, so truthfully, this is a, a it's a journey. And I tell people that it's not about the destination. That's why I always recommend if you're figuring out why you're going on this journey, it doesn't need to be about weight or anybody else. Mm -hmm. It needs to be about you. Why do you want to go on this journey? Because truthfully, when we go on a trip, let's say, for example, I decide that I'm going to Chicago. Okay. I fly, drive, take a train, whatever, from here to Chicago. The trip is not over because I hit the city limits. The trip is not over when I hit the city limits. I don't turn around and go back home. The trip really is about what am I going to do after I cross the city limits? Mm -hmm. It's about the people I'm going to be with. It's about the memories that I'm going to create. It's about you know, the things that I'm going to do. Yes, and even the food that I'm going to eat uh, because we can enjoy food but it's not all about the food. So when we go on this journey, it's not about arriving at a destination because truthfully, when we arrive at, at that city limit, a new journey begins. So we're constantly on a journey. And as long as I'm constantly on a journey, I'm always looking, learning, discovering, yearning. I yearn for information. I yearn for inspiration. And that's one of the things I'm grateful for your podcast because your podcast is inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> it's, I, I like your metaphors. It's so true because once you land, then you have new experiences in that new city. And then you have the experience that you, you know, that you get from the trip back home. And then from the weeks, you know, that come after that with now the experience that you have behind you of that trip and the relationships and the food that you ate and the places you visited. So you're right. That is such a great way to look at life is that it's not when I get to here, when I lose this weight or when I can run 10 miles or when I, when this, this will happen. It's now it's, it's always now it's now tomorrow. It's now a month from now. It's always just about living in that moment and, and cultivating those new experiences with no end game in mind. Cause there isn't one hopefully. Right. <laughs> Well, the, um, the, the game is over, you know, right. the day that we take our last breath. Right, right. And who wants to look back and think like, oh, I wish I had done these things or not eaten that burger. Um, how did your, your eating and kind of physical movement change once you started to speak to yourself differently and to, you know, love yourself a little bit more? How did your physical health change? Um, well, I, I lost all the aches and pains. My knees didn't hurt. My feet didn't hurt. Uh, my back didn't hurt. Um, and then I uh, was moving more in, instead of being afraid to walk or finding walking, you know, to be 
boring. Um, I now park at the back of parking lots. It drives my husband crazy. How come you're parking so far away? <laughs> I do that too. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and I began to challenge myself, but really and truly where the real challenge came in was um, I decided I didn't want to look like Jabba the Hutt. So I started working out with weights because <laughs> um, I lost almost 100 pounds. Oh, and wow. um, a- as I you know, went on the, the working out with weights journey, I you know, accomplished that, got to the weight that I wanted to get to. And I told the trainer, I said, you know, I'd really like to take up deadlifting. And she was like, okay, fine, great. Because she had commented that I needed to start building muscle Mm -hmm. um, because I leaned out, you know, as lean as I could get. So anyway, long story short, I now on Mondays do um, deadlifting with the trainer and I'm up to 225 pounds. Uh, And I I do not weigh 225 pounds and I can bench press 85 pounds. and then the other days of the week that I go to the gym, I'm working on, you know, increasing, improving my muscle strength so that I can do the deadlifting. But the benefit to that is I am 64 years old and um, I wanted to rearrange some furniture in my house because my youngest son moved out and I needed to swap some bedrooms around. And we're talking beds, dressers, you know, the whole nine yards. I moved three rooms of furniture all by myself. Wow, that's amazing. In a weekend. Oh my goodness. And when I had moved those same three rooms of furniture six years ago, I had to get somebody to help me. Impressive. So you could literally see the progress that you've made because you were able to do the same thing, but by yourself. Yeah. That's awesome. So now I know, you know, that whatever I demand or, or whatever requirement I put on my body, I can, I can do it. I can do it. I'm not sitting there on the sideline watching somebody else live their life. I'm living my life. Yeah. What do you wish you had known 10 years ago that you know now? I wish that I would have known that my job was not as important as my life Mm. Uh, because I sacrificed myself on the altar of somebody else's company. And I wish that I would have known I need to put my oxygen mask on first because putting everybody else's on is going to leave me laid out in the aisle. That's a really good one. We are not our career. We are not our jobs. It's so easy to, to, to identify so strongly with our roles in the professional world. And at the end of the day, that's, that's, that shouldn't be the priority. I shouldn't say shouldn't. For some people, perhaps it is. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, there's, there has to be that balance where you know you take care of yourself as much as you take care of, again, other people. I love that. That's a really good tip. I've learned that as well. I used to throw myself into work and all it did was get me 30 pounds overweight, really stressed out, drinking too much and had to, you know, quit and move across the country to figure that out. So that's a good one. Anyone can kind of make that shift now. Yeah. But that that goes back to not loving myself because I was looking, looking for something on the outside that I was lacking on the inside and, and, you know, what I was lacking was not loving myself. So I was looking on, you know, for that affirmation from my job. And that's why I said, I sacrificed myself on the altar of a business that really didn't care. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of need that validation almost in a way, which is unnecessary. No. Um, what would be your number one kind of takeaway for someone who's like, all right, this is it. I'm listening to this podcast. It was perfect timing. And this must be, you know, happening for a reason. I'm going to make a change today. What's one thing someone can start to do today, tomorrow morning to create new habits and, and begin that journey for themselves? Well, the first thing that I would recommend that they do is sit down with a pen, their favorite color pen, a stack of paper and some paper towels or Kleenex or something. And in a quiet place and be brutally honest with themselves why they want to go on the journey that has absolutely nothing to do with their weight or anybody else or an event. 
what is it that they see is going to be in the future when they finish this trip? You know, what, what, is, what does that look like? And what, what do they feel right now? And what do they believe they're going to feel when they get to wherever they're going? And the reason that I say don't make it about their weight or anybody else or an event is when we set our why based on a weight, well, then we're setting ourselves up to fail because then immediately, if you don't hit that weight at a certain date, oh my gosh, you're a failure. And so you go back. If it's about somebody else, people are going to disappoint us. People are going to move away. People are going to die. People are going to change. So we don't want to be tying our why to anybody else. If we're doing it for an event, the same thing, the event comes, it goes, we feel like we failed. So truthfully, it doesn't make any difference if you're trying to decide, you know what, I want to give up drinking coffee every day. That's an admirable goal, not one that I have. Um, <laughs> but figure out why it is that you want to, you know, give up coffee. Why is it that you decide today that you want to lose weight? Why? Nothing about your weight, nothing about anybody else, nothing about an event. And be really honest. And the reason I say have tissues or something is I promise as soon as you start digging deep, the tears are going to be coming. And you're Such going to leave. Exactly. Exactly. Because I can guarantee you that why is hiding deep in there. So dig it out. I love that. It's hard, but it's so cathartic. So if anyone's listening and they want to rewind to re-listen to that and to follow those instructions, let us know how it goes because that is powerful. That is uh, one of the most powerful things that you can do is to figure out because then all of your decisions can align with that why. And it becomes a little bit, not easier, but more likely that it'll happen. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, whenever we get derailed, if we know why we're doing this, Okay, well, then that derailment is not such a major derailment because we know we can say, okay, th this is what happened, but you know what? This is what I'm focused on. This is what's driving me. And so yeah. the clearer we are on our why, the easier it is to pick ourselves back up and to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. So much about mindset. It's so true. Oh, I love that. Um, where can everyone find you if they want to dig in deeper and read your book? Um, you can find me at youcanteatlove.com. That's probably the best place to find me. And also there are links to get the book uh, on the website, um, the book, including the coloring book that we talked about. Um, but there's also, um, I have a small, I want to say it's like a 15 minute slide of uh, helping you find your why. So oh, anything- excellent. Um, it's where is it? anyway, it's on the, the main page, uh, for you can't eat love, but everything that you want to know about me is there, including before and after pictures and some of my crazy thoughts and philosophies and things like that. I love that. So everyone can start today by going and getting into the why piece of their journey, and then they can get the book and the coloring book to keep helping them on that path. I love that. Thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story and being vulnerable and open and, you know, providing that insight to others who I have no doubt will benefit from it. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've quite enjoyed it. You're welcome.